Good morning, everybody. Saturday morning, rainy in Ithaca. What else would we expect? All right. My, my, no. my name is Barry Harstein. I'm one of the co-chairs of the University Council. And I am thrilled to, uh, to really help introduce uh, this morning's incredible panel, the, uh, which is, of course, the Forensic Society, which will we'll be debating our Cornell's best days behind us. When you last night had the privilege to see fireworks, I want to let you know you have seen nothing yet. <laughs> so, uh, and just a few minor observations, and that is this team, the Forensic Society, believe it or not, is literally one of the world's best debate teams when they've received ratings. So it's not just making passing comments saying they're really good. They are the very best. So we are, uh, we're very, very proud of everything they've done. And so much of that is, is due to the leadership of, of Sam Nelson, who is the Director of Speech and Debate at Cornell. He has been uh, teaching debate for about 25 years. He started at Cornell as an assistant coach, then left and fortunately had the good judgment to come back to Cornell about eight years ago and has really uh, been inspiring the students ever since. One of the things that I always like to look to when I get an idea of what a professor is all about, I like going to a, a little website. You may check it out. It's called ratemyprofessors.com. And so I, because I, I really wanted to see what are people really, what are the students, what do the students think of Sam? So uh, one comment, and I'm just going to leave it to a couple. Awesome professor, I can't even sit through a three-hour movie, let alone a lecture. But he made it fly by like it was nothing, and I actually look forward to his class. Another one, Sam is hilarious. If he wasn't a debate coach, he could be a, have a successful career as a, as a basically a professional stand-up comedian. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it up to you to judge. And certainly, uh, we know this morning's session is not a comedy, and we're talking about real serious stuff. So without further ado, let me introduce our champion, Sam. Thank you, Barry. I really appreciate those remarks. Um, it took me a long time to craft those responses on rate, but my professor, so I'm glad they finally paid off right. to drown out all, all the negative comments. Uh, but uh, it's been a real pleasure to be part of uh, Cornell and especially part of the Cornell speech and debate team. This very weekend, uh, we are in full force all over North America. So the speech team is uh, participating in a speech tournament as we sit here right now at Cedar Crest College in Pennsylvania. The British parliamentary style debate team is at the University of Toronto at the Hart House Invitational, a tournament that we've won several times. And the policy debate team is the United States Military Academy at West Point, participating in a debate tournament here. And then I save some of our best debaters back so that they could uh, put on a little demonstration for you. We're the largest speech and debate program in North America. We're the second largest in the world. Two years ago, when the International Debate Education Association decided to rank all 1,000 debate, speech and debate programs, Cornell was ranked number one uh, in the world. So. I, I, I rarely get an opportunity to brag on us, but I take them when I get them. So <laughs> that's what I'm doing now. I want to talk a little bit about the debate, what you're about ready to see, explain some of the rules and so you know what's going on. And uh, then after the debate's over, you'll get a chance to vote. Uh, Chrissy Wace, who is, uh, works with Alumni Affairs and Development in the ILR School, will help count the votes. Um, Dave Fody, who is an alum, alumni of Cornell and of the debate team, he was an engineering material science major, now works for MathWorks in a uh, software development company in Boston, or just outside of Boston, will be the timer 
think he's qualified to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I'll introduce the, the debaters um, as well. I guess I'll start with introducing the debaters. On the uh, pro side, on the topic, this house believes Cornell's best days are behind it, will be Savati Pazaner. <laughs> Savati is a human ecology, in the College of Human Ecology. She's a policy analysis and management major uh, with a global health uh, minor. And she's from Egan, Minnesota. She's a junior, and she plans to, after she uh, finishes her undergraduate career, get a master's in public health. Uh, her partner is Connor Monse. Connor is an information sciences major in um, arts and sciences. He's a freshman, and he comes from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On the opposition, we have Nashe Akil. Nashe is a master's in industrial labor relations first year student. Uh, she is from Lahore, Pakistan. She went to school in the UK before she came here to uh, finish her or to start her graduate work. She's the coach of the debate team, but I pressed her into service. Also, She's a former member, one of two members of the British national debate team that toured the United States last year. While she was on the tour, I convinced her to come to here to Cornell and study industrial labor relations and uh, help me coach the debate team. Won that. <laughs> yeah, I won that debate. She's here. Right. Uh, and and uh, Nishay's partner is Jai Li Li, who is from Hangzhou, China. I first met Jai Li five, six years ago, five years ago, I think, uh, in Qatar, where Cornell has a campus, a medical school. It was also the site for the World High School Championships. Jai Li was the top debater for China at that time. I mentioned to her that she should consider Cornell as an option. Again, my debate training worked. <laughs> she, she is now a senior in government and statistics. So she'll be debating with Nishé opposing today's emotion. Here's what you're about ready to see. Each speaker will get seven minutes to make their case. After a minute passes, I'll clap my hands, and then a debater from the other side may stand up and offer a point of information by making this signal, or just stand up. I like it when they put their hand on their head. This is a homage to the early British debaters that had wigs. And when they stood up, their wig might fly off. <laughs> but you can just stand up if you don't want to put your hand on your head and, and say, point of information, or I'd like to take a point of information. The speaker that is, that is in the process of speaking doesn't have to take the point of information. They can say, no, no, thank you. Please sit down. Let me make my point. Or they can say, sure, I'd like to, what's your question? I'll answer it. And so you may see a little bit of like a whack-a-weasel thing going here where they're <laughs> telling people to sit down. But it adds to the fun and excitement of the debate. Let me tell you a little bit about your role. So um, I just returned last week from England. I was at Oxford, and I saw a couple debates at the Oxford Union. And the audience's job is to keep it lively. So if someone says something you really like, feel free to bang your desktop, like something like that. Oh, good job. Here, here. I don't know if you've ever seen Question Time in Parliament. The audience really gets into it. You can even visually say, oh, here, here, you know, that sort of thing. If someone says something that you really hate, and please keep this to a minimum, you can, you can hiss, you can boo, you can say shame, shame, shame. Right, 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 right. So it's a participatory activity for all of you as well. Okay. Are there any questions before we start? No? Okay. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Prime Minister to come up and start today's debate.
Thank you for that introduction, Sam, and thank you for having us today. It's a great opportunity to speak on this uh, beautiful homecoming <laughs> day. Um, 150 years ago, Cornell started from the most humble of origins, from a man who didn't have much education himself, and has grown since to become a reputable and notable institution of higher education. We've produced some of the most notable names in our history. We've produced educators like Bill Nye the Science Guy. We have produced novelists like Toni Morrison, and we have produced scientists in just about every field of academic study. And when we're evaluating whether or not we're going to continue that trajectory, it's important to keep in mind Ezra Cornell's mission statement, which focused on three key areas. First, on an excellence on teaching and learning. Second, an excellence in research. And finally, excellence in outreach. And when we're evaluating based on three, these three criteria, unfortunately, we find that Cornell has started to fall behind. <laughs> First, in terms of its excellence in education. Unfortunately, due to forces that oftentimes Cornell doesn't really control, the cost-benefit analysis when students are even deciding to go to higher education has fundamentally changed. Tuitions across the country have started to rise dramatically, and Cornell has not been an exception in this trend. The average student debt in this country has surpassed, has surpassed credit card debt, and even Cornell students are now graduating with an average of $20,000 in debt. The effects of this are twofold. First is that it pushes students to, to feel even more pressure in an already academically competitive environment. Cornell strives to challenge its students intellectually, and this is great, but if we have students also going through school with the, with the idea that they're graduating with the idea of lifelong debt over their, over their heads, we're going to find that Cornell students are no longer able to engage in their full learning capacity we're distracted, and our goals have shifted from simply learning to being able to pay off our student debts in the future. And the second implication of this draws on of this. So we, because of this increasing cost of attending higher education, we found students and our university being pushed to specialize. When Cornell was founded 150 years ago, it was founded on an institution in which we were supposed to produce people who are well-rounded. We wanted to produce students who engaged in every discipline of study before they chose their specialization. And unfortunately, due to labor market conditions and the environment in which students are graduating, we found that students are pushed to specialize earlier and earlier. We find that students are no longer able to simply take a class just for fun, but rather we, we force students to take classes because it's going to profit them in the future, because it's going to lead to a future profitable career. And we find this problematic because we think that the point of a higher education is not just to be a factory of productive workers. We think that, that a point of higher education education is to produce well-rounded citizens that can engage in their community and make changes globally. This is an important public benefit of universities, and we think that ex excessive spe student specialization undermines this cause. Go ahead. Don't you think students of Cornell are particularly focused and driven? So aren't you infringing on the right to choose whichever part they want? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Don't you think Cornell students are absolutely driven and focused and therefore they should be allowed to take whichever field or discipline they want to go in without this pressure of experimenting when they already know what they want. I would completely agree. I think that Cornell students are especially driven, and especially in the sense that they should be driven to learn and not just to be paying off their student debts. I think that when you're 18, it's really difficult to know exactly what you're going to specialize in and what you're going to study for the rest of your life. No matter how driven you are, you should definitely have the right to be experimenting in any academic discipline that you want. All right, so not only do we have the specialization of students, we also have the specialization of the university itself, right? In the past few years, we've seen the education department of Cornell being cut, which is especially counterintuitive when you see that every student at Cornell has probably at some point been greatly influenced by a teacher in their life and inspired by them. It seems problematic that we don't want to produce those same kinds of teachers from an institution that prioritizes teaching and learning. Rather than investing in our education department, Cornell has begun, begun multi-billion dollar investments in building a tech campus in some really prime real estate in Manhattan. 
While we think technology is really important, we think that every dollar that is invested in the tech campus and like building new buildings and engaging in bidding wars and real estate, we think that that money has an opportunity cost and could have been invested in other departments, prioritizing technology over other disciplines, especially liberal arts disciplines, that oftentimes students are encouraged to engage in, we think is problematic because it undermines the notion of Cornell being an institution in which any student pursuing any discipline of education should be supported. The second area of, of criticism in which we need to look is excellence in research. And we found that Cornell's past is extraordinarily rich in producing research that has been influential and novel in their fields. For example, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences played an integral role in producing research that led to many biofortified foods in the Green Revolution. However, today we see that a lot of the research that Cornell engages in has become too academic. This is a problem that spurs across the field of academia, but we found that a lot of the research that Cornell produces has been detached from reality. A lot of times we engage in really theoretical research that doesn't really engage the average person and doesn't have a notable impact on the everyday life. We also find that even when we find research that does have novel ideas that could influence people's lives, we see that oftentimes these great ideas are never implemented. The advocacy side that comes along with research is not engaged in. So finally, we want to look towards Cornell's excellence in outreach. And this is especially an area of rich history within Cornell. In the 1960s, the Cornell civil rights movement on campus was enormous, and we found sit-ins, and we found hunger strikes. We were a hub of progressive social action. During the South African apartheid, Cornell students built a mock shanty town on campus and advocated heavily for Cornell to divest from the South African apartheid. We saw that Cornell students were not just interested in learning, but were interested in applying these lessons and necessarily engaging the community and even criticizing the administration. However, today we found that activism takes a completely different form. We see very fragmented groups across campus that usually don't have a strong following, engaging in protests that maybe have 20 to 30 people showing up, putting posters everywhere that often don't translate into real outcomes. And we found that students simply are engaging in social media activism rather than in-person, physical, outcomes-driven action. <laughs> We think this is especially problematic given that Cornell has in the past been an area in which students can learn to engage with their community and to challenge a lot of the institutions that we've been taught are in place and unchangeable. If we're not engaging with that, Cornell no longer becomes an area in which we're pushing society to change, to modify, and we're not building these world-changing students that we want to create from any institution of higher education that Cornell has been especially good at in producing in the past. So for these three reasons, first, because excellence in teaching and learning has diminished, second, because research has become increasingly detached from reality, and finally, because of an, an emphasis on outreach has slowly fallen, we believe that Cornell has seen its best days in a rich history of academia and a rich history of impact-driven interventions. However, today, we found that Cornell has already seen those best days and is unlikely to reach that extraordinarily high bar that has already been set. Thank you. Thank you. Swati is a nice girl. <laughs> but she's far too pessimistic for her age. <laughs> she paints a picture of Cornell for you, and I'm going to tell you from the beginning. Cornell is a castle of contradictions, a palace, but a palace of paradoxes. She's told you lots of things, so let me classify them for you. She wants Cornell to be local, yet international, creative, yet applied, specialized, yet interdisciplinary, innovative, yet conservative. Basically, do more with less. What Swati forgets is that Cornell operates in the real world, faces real challenges, and sometimes the consequences 
are less than ideal. But then again, ladies and gentlemen, Garnell has never been a coward. I agree, the future is now. There is internationalism, globalization, massification, and with that, we face something that is harsher than Ithaca's cold winters. <laughs> Unemployment, ladies and gentlemen, is a harsh reality of our world. And we think that Cornell does better, better than most. I would say better than all. I'm gonna tell you why that is so. I think she has overestimated the effect of these changes and these conditions. I'm gonna tell you that during the recession, Cornell was one of the only institutions that refused to cut any kind of aid to the students who were the most vulnerable. I'm gonna tell you today, a majority of the students receive some form of financial assistance from this institution, where many institutions back down, Cornell doesn't. And I'm going to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, that even though in our rapidly changing economy we face stubborn unemployment, there are certain skills that Cornell imparts that are transferable. It requires its students to be critical, to be analytical, to have cultural and numerical literacy, but first and foremost to have ethical judgment. But enough seriousness. Let's get on to some examples. And they've been fun. She said, research is too academic and not applied. I'm gonna tell you that is not true. We have biomedical engineering in healthcare in Tanzania. That's real. We have identified a gene that's linked to the development of cancer in mice. It's useful. We figured out why and when tomatoes can be drought resistant. Interesting. But I'm gonna tell you why my school, the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, is like focusing on something that is far more cutting edge. It's investing its time to useful things, like how to recover after cracking a bad joke in the workplace. <laughs> Nobody needs that, right? Maybe we have regressed. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that students are far more involved than they were in the past. It's just that times have changed. We do have students protesting against sexual violence in all its form, in the form of Take Back the Night. The Climate Action Rally made President Scotton change his plans. Ooh. He said we're going to have a carbon neutral campus by 2050, and students said, uh-uh, that is far too late. The goal is now to have a carbon-free university by 2035. Still a bit late, but we're working on it. And finally, the Cornell Organization for Labor Action continues to work against um, harsh conditions for workers so that they may have more dignity where they work. Ladies and gentlemen, I can give you a lot of other examples, but that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna simply talk to you about what Cornell is as a home for students. It is far more interdisciplinary than it was years ago, and though I do know and I do believe and I do applaud the many achievements Cornellians have had over the past 150 years. It is far too premature to say that our best days are behind us. I'm gonna simply tell you that there's only one certainty about the future and that it's absolutely uncertain. But Cornellians have never been afraid of uncertainty. I'm gonna tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if Cornellians cannot predict the future, we must simply invent it. And that requires vision. And that is what our students have. That is what our alumni have had. That is what we continue to have. And that's not limited to any student being either focused in one discipline. We think focus is good. We think when students know what they want, when they know how to get what they want is great. But at the same time, I'll take you in just a minute, some experiment, and the focus on liberal arts education has been higher than it has been ever before. Sure. The global problems that you're talking about require an interdisciplinary approach, and the specialization that you're talking about necessarily undermines students' ability to do so. I disagree. <laughs> 
<laughs> because you assume that if you are focusing on something that you're only doing one thing, within a particular focus, you have modules that span across disciplines. So if I'm doing a degree in industrial and labor relations, it is not just that I'm studying about a particular workplace. It is highly globalized, highly comparative, but at the same time, it makes me take courses like communication, things like the law, about economics, about society. And we think that all of those contribute to the gaining of skills that are transferable. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna leave you with this thought. I'm gonna tell you that 150 years have been, eh, all right. <laughs> They've been fine. You've done well. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They've been great. They've been grand. But they're going to be better. Thank you. Thank you. Any architect will tell you that a building is only as good as its blueprint. A good blueprint lays the foundation for a strong building and a strong future for the people who use that building. A weak one doesn't do that quite as well, but the blueprint that they're giving you for the future of Cornell just hopes that those investments that we're making right now will pay off and create a strong future. We don't believe that we can assume that those investments will create the positive benefits that they wanted to. So instead, the government side is going to look at those investments and look at the future that those investments are actually going to create. She's right when she says that the future is uncertain, but we can get a glimpse at what the future holds by looking at the investments we're making in education and in uh, the programs that we have at Cornell, and from there, we can see whether or not Cornell's best days are behind it. So in this speech, I'm gonna be bringing you three things. First, I'm gonna be talking about the changing nature of higher education and Cornell's role in that changing world. Second, I'm gonna be looking at a few specific investments that Cornell is making in spite of that changing world, and third of all, we're gonna be delving into the mission statement again and looking into how Cornell's investments affect each of those three pillars. So first of all, let's talk about the changing nature of higher education. First of all, remember, uh, let's look back to the history of Cornell itself. When Ezra Cornell founded uh, this institution in 1865, he fundamentally changed and redefined what a liberal arts education was. It was no longer just studying Latin or studying Greek. Instead, it was making practical applications in a wide variety of fields in interdisciplinary uh, disciplinary fields and making real changes with real practical research and applications in the world. That's the foundation that Cornell is on. Unfortunately, like Savati told you in her last speech, that's no longer the world that we live in because of how a higher education is changing. Now, students have to worry about student debt. They have to worry about their job prospects and they have to worry about their future. Sure. But what about the tomatoes? The tomatoes are really great, but you can't. You, uh, we can give you several examples of specific pieces of research that are really good. But if you look to the overall trend of research at Cornell, we find that Cornell's research is decreasingly practical and more and more academic. We believe that that trend highlights the future of Cornell, and if you follow that trend to its logical extreme, then we no longer see Cornell as this bastion of practical applications and real world changing ideas, but rather a bastion of ideas that only matter to the stodgy people that are stuck up in the ivory tower. <laughs> Second of all, under the uh, changing nature of higher education, the debt also affects the quality of life of students, both while they're at Cornell, but also after they leave Cornell. First of all, while they're at Cornell, like Savati noted, this is an incredibly uh, competitive academic environment. That leads to incredibly high amounts of stress within students, and that means that they're constrained uh, to only take classes that are core to their major because they know that they need to be extremely competitive in those core classes in order to get a job and in order, uh, in order to be competitive in the workplace after they graduate. So while they're here, we have enormous stresses. But that's okay, right? Because that means we're producing these really big thinkers. Unfortunately, that isn't true either. First of all, when students have to specialize because their uh, academic decisions are constrained by the labor market, they're no longer able to get that holistic liberal arts education that Ezra Cornell intended the graduates of Cornell University to have. Instead, we get these incredibly academic, incredibly stodgy, incredibly specialized people who no longer have practical applications and no longer have the capability to make the big world-changing uh, ideas that Cornell was intended to create. At that point, we don't think that Cornell 
Cornell's best days are ahead of it. Rather, we look to the bright past of Cornell and see that we can't replace that under the current uh, status of higher education. Sure. You condemn the fall of the holistic education of Cornell. At the same time, you, you also condemn the rise of more academic research. How does these two things coexist? Sure, because we believe that academic research should fundamentally be focused on practical applications that help people. Not just cherry-picked examples, but holistically the research environment of Cornell should uh, incentivize these practical applications. That's no longer what we're seeing. The trend is towards these more academic, more theoretical applications of research. Second of all, let's look to the investments that Cornell is making in the future right now and why that's going to paint a downward trend for the future. First of all, let's look to the campus. And Savadi talked about this a little bit. But remember, Nietzsche tells you the future is now. So the investments that we're making right now indicate the trajectory that Cornell will take going into the future. So first of all, the tech campus is fundamentally following a tech trend. The tech campus isn't going to be done for decades. At that point, we're going to be very late to a market that's rapidly maturing. That means people who are uh, getting trained in the future are entering a market that is no longer having the same amounts of growth that it is right now. So Cornell is following a trend rather than creating a trend. We think that indicates that Cornell's best days are behind it. But second Second of all, Cornell's ambition to create these trends and follow these trends fundamentally constrains its future. We believe that the specialization that this creates in terms of tech is going to be extremely limiting to graduates going into the future. This is harmful because when those graduates specialize like they are right now and like they'll increasingly have to do so with the changing labor market going into the future, we do not believe that the tech campus will actually provide real benefits for the graduates of Cornell. We do not believe that we should follow these trends, but we should rather be creating people who have a holistic liberal arts education to create those trends in the first place. Second of all, let's look to outreach programs like Cornell University Engage. This has a large amount of funding. Now that sounds really great on paper. We have this grand vision of how Cornell is going to incentivize its students to reach out into the community. The problem is that we don't actually know where that money is going to go. We don't understand the allocation. We don't even understand how we want the mechanism for outreach to work. We don't know who it wants to benefit, uh, who we want it to benefit. At that point, even when we have the investments to make into the future, we don't have adequate planning and we don't have the uh, sufficient resources uh, to actually figure out how that's going to make a practical impact in the world. So again, we're stuck with this, these grand ideas about the future of Cornell, but when you look to the practical applications of the money, the research, and the academics at Cornell, we're not actually seeing those things translate into real benefits. But finally, let's look to the mission statement and kind of recap what we've seen today. So first of all, remember, in terms of teaching and learning, we're not getting the same benefits that Ezra Cornell intended when he created a liberal arts education. We have intense amounts of specialization and a decreased quality of life for students because of the changing nature of higher education. We say that's harmful. We say that indicates that Cornell's best days and its best researchers and its best ideas are behind it. Second of all, let's look to the research, which again, the trend shows us it's becoming increasingly academic and less and less practical. That practicality means, again, we have less of those big world-changing ideas and more and more of these theoretical applications that sound great on paper but not in the real world. Finally, let's look to these outreach programs. Like Savati told you, in the past we had shanty towns being built to protest apartheid. We had incredible amounts of civil rights engagement. In the status quo, though, we don't have any of that. We have these very small organizations that don't have a lot of practical impact in the real world. So again, what we're seeing the trend for Cornell being is moving from a university that prioritizes graduates with practical skills who are making real life changes uh, in people around the world and making real progress in a variety of studies now our graduates are making progress in theoretical applications of one study without actually engaging the larger uh, practical implementations of those ideas. We think that Cornell's best days are behind it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Cornell has been just most recently being rated as the institution that provides the most valuable bachelor degree to its undergrad students, given that undergrad students from Cornell has been earning the highest entry-level job wage across the country. 
This is why we, show, we believe on the, on the opposition side that Cornell has been doing great in preparing its students for the practical world, to go into the world and do, make practical change for their own lives and to the, for the world. That's precisely the reason why I strongly oppose the points that Connor has been making. I'm going to do three things. I'm going to talk about is uh, specific under the, like, at the same order as how Swati started her speech on why Cornell is going to do great in its excellence in teaching and learning, in research, and in outreach. So, uh, my partner, Nishé, has told you that future is not in our hands to predict. That's true. And it's also in the hands of Cornellians to invent it. And now I'm going to answer the question of how Cornell has been preparing students to invent that future that we can envision and can be great. So before that, several points of rebuttal on what Connor has told you. Firstly, on the idea that we have a changing nature of higher education, and given that Cornell has an increasing focus on theoretical research over practical research. We think, firstly, it's not true, given how we have seen so many specific examples from Nishay's speech on how uh, these researchers has had practical and real life impact on our community and on the international level. But more importantly, we think that only because for from Connor's perspective, that you can't see a practical need on this day of a study of string theory doesn't necessarily mean that that kind of study doesn't lay a fundamental background for any engineering progress in the future. We need to look into the fact that a lot of theoretical research are necessary and important to future practical application of these theories. And that's precisely why institutions like Cornell that are pioneering all these fields should be investing that resource and energy into these research that can provide future benefits to the, to the community that we're living in as a whole. But secondly, he talked about how the tech campus is going to be only following the trend and not creating a trend and why it's not a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you the fact that the tech campus has already started teaching in 2013 in a Google building that's provided. Also, the first phase is going to finish construction in 2017. It's a very very near future we're seeing. It's a new technology and startup community that we see Cornell being deeply involved in its development in New York City. We don't think that's necessarily a bad thing that Cornell is doing. No, thank you. And thirdly, he talked about how investment has not been used in good places. I'm going to show you in my third point why we think there are so many opportunities where Cornell faculties and members has been outreaching to its community and why these monies will be in good use. So firstly, why we think that Cornell has been preparing its students for uh, excellence in teaching and learning and why we think it's going to yield to a very bright future. Ladies and gentlemen, 26% of Cornell undergrads end up going to grad school and, uh, and pursuing a more academic career in all these research fields that they are interested. Most recently, the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry winner are two Cornell alumni. All these I'll take a minute. All the examples show you how Cornell has been preparing its individuals, not only to the, uh, to the professional world that they're entering, but also the academic spheres that has been creating a lot of important changes to the world. Yes. So that Nobel Prize was won for micro, microfluorescent microscopy. I can barely say that. How is that not an academic application of Cornell's research? This is. This research was significant because it helped scientists to be able to look into the parts of molecules that were not able to be seen by microscopes before. We think this particular technology can help a lot of chemists around the world to help to develop uh, like uh, to help developments in a lot of the medical fields that is going to eventually develop uh, like advance uh, is eventually going to help individuals like us after years. We, that's why we recognize this importance of all these developments. We think there is also a trend of diversified graduate program and undergraduate program, given Cornell's specific emphasis on interdisciplinary research among graduate students, and we think these are good things that. Cornell has been doing to provide the students with a good academic environment to thrive. And these trends have been developing in a way that's going to uh, 
benefits future Cornell, uh, Cornell students. And that's precisely why we say the future is going to be bright given that positive trend. And secondly, on the point of research, why we think research has been a strength of Cornell and is, continue, is going to continue to be and bring more benefits. As we, t we talk about, there are so many pioneering research of Cornell uh, faculties. Most recently, Professor Elsa Shields of the Co uh, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences has developed this method that can substantially reduce the cost of farmers in northern New York State uh, and in their dairy farms. We think that's a perfect example of how Cornell's investment in research has continuously yielded positive results for its community. I'll take you in a moment. But also, it also leads very nicely to the third point of how Cornell faculties and students has been able to use that money that Proposition Intersight has been considered with, with nowhere to go, but to go to good places that can help our community. Yes. Okay, we've already talked about how a lot of times even these great research ideas aren't translated into actual policies. So even the ideas that you're talking about have yet to actually help people and been implemented on a personal level. Well, the example I discussed was precisely implemented on personal level, given 6,000 dairy farms in New York State has already started impl uh, applying that technology that our Professor Shields has developed. We think there are more examples on that uh, that I can provide on how Cornell's uh, faculties and members has been trying to help its community. But furthermore, we think that Cornell community itself has been reached by this knowledge and information. For example, we've seen Cornell Daily Sun as one of the most powerful and respected platform of discussion of ideas. I think these are important facts to show us how Cornell students not, not only has been involved in activism of so many examples that you've discussed, but also on campus has been actively involved and caring about things around the world. This has been a trend that's happening on the campus and we need to keep it, and we think it's a good thing to keep these. Ladies and gentlemen, because Cornell has been preparing students to invent the future in all these various ways. We believe that our future is going to be bright, and that belief and that confidence in that envision is precisely important. Thank you. Now comes the moment of truth, the vote. So uh, Chrissy, uh, will you count the votes the best you can? OK, great. So all those in favor of the pro side that, um, or the pro side <laughs> that Cornell's best days are behind it, please raise your hand. Don't be intimidated by your neighbors. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of the opposition, please raise your hand. Seems like it's quite a, yeah. Looks like more vote for the opposition. The opposition win today's debate.